How many were not here last night down the street? Oh, oh okay. more than half. That makes it challenging. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there a clicker? Or do we, I guess we just do this. Today's workshop is exciting. I, uh, I do travel around the world and, and explain sea level rise and its nuances and impacts because it, it is challenging to get, it, get your head around. Um, I mean, I, last week was the Miami Chamber of Commerce. We were all very surprised that they were willing to, to confront the issue of sea level rise, which is much more threatening down there than it is here, frankly. It's four feet above sea level and porous limestone seawalls won't work down there. And uh, so the, there's no high ground to move to. Uh, so, you know, every place is different. I was in Hong Kong week before. Um, and what's really impressed me coming up to uh, Rhode Island, but also in the discussions I've had on the phone over the last few weeks with uh, Pam from CRC and meeting <coughs> uh, New York City a few months ago and talking about this, is just how cohesive you are in looking at your coastal vulnerability. Of course, it's inescapable here, a small state in Narragansett Bay and the other coastal bays. Um, you can't avoid the, the uh, dominance of the ocean and its vulnerability. And what I want to help you think through is we're going to talk about adapting to rising seas and extreme storm events is the similarities with the differences. Because it's tempting or very easy to kind of overlook or misunderstand sea level because it hasn't happened in so long. 120,000 years to be exact. Sea level has not been higher than today for 120,000 years. To avoid you having to take notes at the end, I'm going to give you a simple, dedicated email address if you send it, you don't even need a message to it. Um, I'll just <coughs> tell you what it is, and, and uh, I'll send you some slides and a page of notes and so on, and all kinds of facts. And you certainly feel free to take notes, but uh, any of the numbers that I throw out here today, you don't need to uh, jot down. We know that. Um, what a storm event is. I mean, this is an iconic photograph of Sandy, not here in this state, but just showing how what happens when a severe storm hits at an extreme tide. And um, in different places of the world, just to, to take you out of your own uh, immediate environment here, you know, this is Fort Lauderdale, I'm not far from where I live. A month after Sandy, a no-name storm destroyed the main road, actually took out four blocks of the blacktop. Uh, in front of all the Fort Lauderdale hotels, which is the heart of our tourism industry down there. Um, Annapolis, Maryland, flooding events. Miami, Florida, every 28 days, roads have been flooding. They've just effectively put in $15 million of pumps to suck the water out of about 10 blocks on Main Street in Miami Beach. But they, the Miami Beach mayor Phil Levine has become a new friend uh, and a big uh, fan of my book and, and my explanations of this. Uh, admits that it's just the first battle in a very, very long war, as he describes it. It's hard to conceptualize this. Seattle, San Francisco. Now, what's different about the last three images, and that's from Hong Kong, actually. Um, when you're up to your chest in water, all flooding may look the same. What's this like the slogan? Uh, you know, when you're uh, up to your ass in alligators, it's hard to remember you wish was to drain the swamp. It's a common thing in Florida. But um, what I want you to do is realize that all flooding is not the same. And in a way, preparing for higher sea level makes you more resilient to storms, to some degree but in some ways not. So what I'd like you to get really start to think about is a new future, one where we have more extreme storms, as the title of this program suggests, but also where sea level slowly changes, and inevitably now. It's really hard to get our heads around that. Because, you know, we take certain things for granted. The sun's going to rise tomorrow, the tide's going to go up and down tomorrow, and sea level is sea level. And the coast is the coast. And it's been that way for 5,000 years. It's hard to imagine a new reality that doesn't have the coastline where the coastline has been for all of human civilization. But it's now inevitable. So we need to distinguish different kinds of flooding, whether it's from storms, extreme tides, slowly rising sea level, 
subsidence of the land, which effectively has the same effect. You don't have much subsidence here compared to a place like Norfolk or Tokyo or Jakarta where they have extreme subsidence causing extreme sea level rise. Or Alaska, which has the converse, where Alaska is rising and causing sea level to appear to fall. Again, it's hard to get our heads around that. We take the shoreline as the static. You know, above sea level or below sea level, what's, what's the most common metric on the planet? Is where are you in relation to sea level? As if it's a constant. And the runoff from heavy rainfall, you certainly have those problems, and we're going to get more of that as we get more moisture there as the oceans uh, continue to warm from global warming. And how you get direct runoff events, which you get downstream uh, from the hills and mountains, etc. And then erosion is a different kind of flooding phenomenon, but it's worth listing. So all of those things can put someplace underwater, but call for a little different understanding of planning and adaptation. Because they have different drivers, different predictability. I can tell you when the extreme tide's gonna happen to the, to the hour, years in advance. When those streets are gonna flood in Miami, we can say October 9th, 9.28 a.m., we knew it was coming, the highest tide of the year. We have no idea with an extreme storm. Sea levels, a different challenge to predict. The magnitudes, the permanence, as I call it, and the impact zones are entirely different with sea level rise from storms. Entirely different. Now let's look at this just simple conceptual diagram. There's sea level there, a solid yellow at the bottom of the red line. Sea level varies a little bit, but just kind of that line is plotting what happens. And we, on top of that, we get extreme high tides. Daily high tides, and then of course, the spring tide, the monthly lunar high tides, spring tides, etc. We're familiar with that. Extreme storm surge on top of that. What this picture illustrates is that the maximum water height is the combination of, well, can be the combination of all those things. But what we don't think about is that sea level won't go down. It's totally different than storm or other flood events in that it's a one-way phenomenon, effectively. People who look at the issue say that the soonest we can have sea level falling is a thousand years. So let's call it permanent. In fact, estimates are that it's probably much longer than that. Because the ice sheets have to get back into growth mode and the oceans have to be cooler and there's so much heat that's been added to the ocean that there's just no way to get there from here. Uh, while it's been an ignored subject for a long time, just a year ago, National Geographic put it as the cover story. And uh, I don't think they stole it from my, the opening line of my book, which most of you now have, I think, courtesy of uh, CRC. But um, I start out the first line of my book saying, when all the ice melts, sea level will be 212 feet higher. And they showed it against the Statue of Liberty, that number. Sea level hasn't changed much in 5,000 years. <clears throat> What's happened to sea level? What do we know about it? Well, we know that as a global average, and you're not too far from the global average here, which is convenient in terms of looking at the phenomenon, that sea level has risen about eight inches in the last century or so. Now, sometimes in the press or even scientists get into, well, why did the line dip three years ago? Why is it heading down? And maybe now sea level stopped rising and it's going to go down. Well, that's nonsense. And the trend can be your friend whether you like it or not see where it's heading. And it's pretty clear from this trend, and I'm going to show you why this trend is so set and put it in a bigger context in a moment. But regardless of the blips, I mean, if this was a stock and you could invest in this company for 160 years, you wouldn't care that it went down last week, right? Because you'd have pretty good confidence that that trend line was set. So again, you may not like a trend, but you can get ahead of it as long as you can step back and see it. Now that same eight inches of sea level rise in 13 different cities in America, the eight inches is the red horizontal wavy line near the bottom. You see that, really? The, uh, the 13 cities are New Orleans or Grand Isle on the left, 46 inches, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, 30, New York in the middle, 14, Miami next to it, and down to Los Angeles, four inches on the right. The difference is land uplift or subsidence. Norfolk's going down, New Orleans is compacting, um, 
Los Angeles has been lifted by the Pacific Plate, which is why we have all the earthquakes out there. So it's important to recognize that one size sea level doesn't fit all. And most of the numbers talk about the global average. You're a little farther than the global average, I think, according to um, Dean Corliss told me yesterday, that, uh, or John Kingle was over at URI, that you're probably uh, 20 or 30 percent above the global average. But given that we're having uh, three millimeters a year, the truth is it's insignificant. For each foot that sea level rises, the shoreline moves inland. Now the ratio is surprising, and here's the difference between sea level and storm surge. You know what happens in storm surge. You, you see the dune lines at any beach or shoreline, and different shorelines have different characteristics. But sea level on global average moves in 300 feet horizontally for each foot vertically. You say, how could that be? That's not the ratio of typical shoreline. Because sea level gets inland to the low areas, the marshland. It doesn't just hit at the beach. So that's, again, a huge difference between the storm and the wave kind of damage that we, that we face. It goes up tidal rivers. If we step back and look at the last ice age, we start to get a much clearer picture of the big picture. I'm going to give you one or two more step back views to bigger pictures. But since the last ice age 20,000 years ago, and people here in New England are very familiar with the ice ages, if you will. You're living on, on glacial moraines and, and, and features that were carved out uh, during the fairly common ice ages. But sea level is down 390 feet below today. Straight down. Hard to believe. The reason we have it hard to, it's hard to believe is that look at the plateau toward the upper right there. Sea level has been pretty constant for 5,000 years. That's effectively human civilization. That's why we don't believe this is going to change much. Now, many scholars believe that the sudden rise 14,000 years ago, what scientists call meltwater pulse 1A, when sea level rose 65 feet in four centuries, that's an average of a foot and a half a decade for 40 decades by nature. No impact to man. Many think that that accounts for the biblical and the Quranic and other old texts account of the flood. The Ice Ages, uh, this four-part mini-series, I don't know how many of you watch this scientific series, the kids or grandkids, you, you may have watched this as many times as I did. My daughter was six when this came out. I watched this 20 or 30 times, not by choice. And behind Manny, San Diego, Scat, and the other animals there, there's two miles of ice. And I do it for two reasons. When we're looking at a really tough subject like this, or a very sobering subject, it's good to get people to laugh, and I share that idea with you. Uh, you need a little bit of sugar to make the medicine go down and process this. But it also helps people visualize what the Ice Ages were. And although it was a cartoon, it's reasonably adheres to actual geologic history. The ice space didn't look quite like that. But that two miles of ice that covered the northern hemisphere, 10,000 feet of ice, as it melted, it turned into almost 400 feet of sea level rise. That makes sense. That's all the science you need to know about that. But to put it in different visual terms, if we are at the 30th floor of a building with the current sea level, during the last ice age, sea level was at the ground floor. 30 floors down. It's been rising inches. But when all the ice melts, it'll rise another 17 floors. It's stunning. Now, it won't happen this century, it won't happen next century, the century after. There's no need to panic. But it is good to start to see the reality of the planet so that we can plan intelligently, which is what this is all about. Whether this happens for three, in 300 years or 3,000 years, we simply don't know. The models can't tell us that yet. And that's frustrating. But you know, people say, why, why don't the models know? Models are just models, whether it be inflation, interest rates, the, the spread of disease, Population, we've had population projections from 12 billion to 9 billion, and now they're going back to 10 million. We know what causes population to grow. We know what lifespans are. Population models change all the time. The collapse of the ice sheet in Antarctica and in Greenland are really hard to model. And un un unintentionally, 
And uh, very confusingly, the way the scientific protocols are done, typically for the big IPCC report, um, and for all the models actually, tends to make them conservative, but not in the way you normally think conservative, like what, what could happen. It's what do we know will happen, and they discount the uncertainties. They actually leave them out, and they, they explain that in the fine print. And as a result, the models really don't show what can happen. They show what we know will happen, and they leave the uncertainties off the table. And it's important to understand that, because it means that the models are low and all essentially prove that to you bit. So what causes sea level? We tend, most people, I would say, think that rising sea levels because of the melting polar ice cap, and they get concerned about the polar bears. But the melting polar ice cap is not why sea level is rising. That's floating ice, and just like ice cubes in a glass or a pitcher, has no effect on the height of the liquid, as contrary as that might seem. The impact of the melting Arctic is significant, though. As we go from bright white to dark ocean, the warming speeds up, just like turning your roof, if you turn a white roof into a black roof. Temperature of the house will change, right? So that's happening in the Arctic. And the significance is people say, oh, well, John, this has happened before. It's a natural cycle. I say, absolutely right. There is a natural cycle here. But the Arctic's been frozen for three million years. Three million years. Think about that. It's going to be ice free in our lifetime, starting in September for a few weeks and growing periods each decade because of the warmer oceans. So we have a visual indicator. It's not a matter of somebody's instruments and where the instruments were. Ice melts at 32 degrees, whether you're Republican or Democrat. It doesn't really care what you believe. We have a visual proof that the planet is warming at an unusual level. And the growing floating sea ice around East Antarctica is not a contradiction to this. We don't really have time here to talk about why that's not an anomaly. Uh, but the polar ice cap is, is an important visual. But what does raise sea level is glaciers that break off into icebergs. And as the ice transitions from here's a photograph I took in Greenland in 2007, as, as the ice goes from being on the land into the ocean, that's when sea level rises, or when the water runs into the ocean. And the other thing is thermal expansion. It's the ocean, just like metal parts in the wintertime, as things warm, they change dimensions slightly. Well, sea level has risen about four inches because of thermal expansion, just heating the oceans a degree and a half Fahrenheit. The other four inches that we've had so far comes from Greenland, uh, well, and, and other glaciers in the world, the 200,000 trapped glaciers in the world, from Alaska to the Alps. But going up the glacier, I just want to help you visualize the other feature you should distinguish between an iceberg and a glacier is the ice sheet. There's two big ice sheets on the planet, one on Greenland and one in Antarctica. They're about two or three miles thick, very similar to that cartoon I showed you of the ice ages across all of North America and Asia. But the ice sheet in Greenland this picture doesn't show a lot, it's just that it's vast. There's no mountains. It just goes on and on forever, apparently. But when you look at it from the helicopter, as you can see in this photo I took in, again, 2007, you see the sheen on the left there. I don't know if you can see that, but that's the melting. And the water's gathering. This is a flat ice sheet. This isn't runoff from some mountain range. This is just that the ice sheet is melting. And it's gathering in these rivulets into bigger and bigger streams. But when we stand back and look at the planet, the parts we don't normally think of or look at, that's the problem. There's enough ice there to dramatically raise sea level. And in the 100,000 year ice age cycle, the normal ice age cycle, driven by a slight variation in the solar energy we receive, kind of like a super summer winter, if you think of it that way, uh, because of some orbital eccentricities. And that's really what it is. The same difference as we determine summer and winter really determines the ice ages. It's a coalescence of three different uh, astrological cycles, but that triggers the ice age. We had a peak ice age 20,000 years ago. We are at the normal warm spot or high spot of sea level, and I'm going to show you in a minute that we really should have started the, co the cooling period, but we're not. Antarctica, just to finish the, the source of where this, the water can come from is 
a little different than Greenland. It does have mountains. It's far bigger island, thicker ice sheet, has seven times the amount of water locked up in it. And Antarctica is really hard to perceive, even having been there twice. Um, it's white, you know, and, it, and it, it's the kind of confusing thing because it's hard to distinguish features. But there are different parts of Antarctica, and in fact, in this colorized photo to show where they're melting and movement of the glaciers, the problem is in the 8 o'clock position, what's called the Pine Island Glaciers. I'll show you more about that in just a moment, but that's the potential for sea level rise. And the news out of Pine Island Bay in the last year, six months, month, is not good. In fact, if you want to see a little video, just go to my website, and I'll give you the address at the end, but uh, John and I've got a, a YouTube posting, so uh, there's some great videos. Don't watch them late at night before you're trying to go to sleep. Uh, one's from Greenland, one's from Antarctica, and it really will show you in very vivid, vivid video, not that I've done, but I've taken them off YouTube uh, with some NASA scientists. The news out of Antarctica from this area is, is really should be disconcerting. And again, it's not to distract from the great coastal planning and storm preparedness you're doing. It's to say there's another phenomenon happening and to keep that in mind as because preparing for higher sea level will prepare us better for storm defenses too in many cases. But they're different phenomena in scale and time period and, and permanence. So when we look back at sea level in the longer time, this is 400,000 years. This is four ice age cycles. Sea level goes up and down as the ice sheets melt and freeze. Of course, left to right. We're at the top part of the normal curve. If we layer on top of that, global temperature and CO2 in green, global temperature, temperature in red for warmth, if you want to think of it, and green for CO for greenhouse gas, CO2, carbon dioxide. An amazing thing happens when you look at 400,000 years of records. The peaks line up. There's a regular period, about every 100,000 years. And we're at the top part of the cycle if you look at sea level and temperature. But the problem is in the far upper right, that little red ellipse that's circling a vertical green line. Do you see that? And showing that CO2 has broken out of the normal range for millions of years of 180 to 280 parts per million, and it's now at 400 going straight up. That's not quickly stoppable. And even if we could stop it today, even if we did all the right energy and conservation and alternative fuels and everything else and never put another molecule of CO2 in the air, the extra heat that's already in the ocean guarantees that the ice will keep melting. We don't tend to think of that. Which leads me to a different conclusion than most. We need to adapt to rising sea level and also try and do the things to slow the warming so it doesn't become catastrophic. But as you people here in Rhode Island, the ocean state know better than anyone else on the planet, you know, the ocean is both, uh, is two-faced. It's kind and friendly and nurturing and the wellspring of, of life probably in many ways. It's also treacherous, unforgiving, doesn't care what we think. And we need to be able to live with that ocean. And you're doing the right things here, not only with this day-long seminar, but with your longer-term efforts um, through the Coastal Resources Center, the Department of Environmental Management, uh, the various state university uh, things to understand the science and to apply it, which I really you know, applaud you on and, uh, what you're doing today. But this picture, and by the way, one of the things I will, if you send me an email to the address I'm going to give you um, at the end, I'll, I'll give you a couple of these graphic slides to use because this, this slide is something I prepared, but it really came from Dr. James Hansen, the famous NASA scientist who probably is the leading uh, climate expert on the planet in, in some ways, and uh, his colleague, Mickey Cosedo. And uh, they helped me do this for my book. This, this graph's in the book in black and white, so you'll have it there. But if you want this slide to be able to use in PowerPoints, I'm glad to share it. We get that data from ice cores. Some of you are familiar with that. In Greenland and Antarctica, we drill down. And kind of similar, we get tree rings by drilling into a tree horizontally, drill down into the ice, 
And as in that person's fingers, there's a sliver there that represents about a year of compacted snow into pressurized ice. And the pressure, or I should say the, the bubbles, the bright spots there, are air samples. We've got 800,000 years of air samples, and we can, we can actually identify them back to within three years of the year they were laid down. And the carbon dioxide in those bubbles is still intact, and we can tell temperature on a relative basis by the oxygen isotope 16 and 18. So pretty neat technology, or uh, somebody said pretty cool technology. Um, but it's a great historical record. It really does correlate with the levels of sea level that we can find in the geologic record. So that's how we get this big picture. But we know because of the correlation, and it's simple physics, this isn't theory, that carbon dioxide traps heat proven in 1826, not a modern finding, didn't require electricity, basic physics and chemistry, that CO2 traps heat, and we know that as the oceans warm by external sources, meteorites or volcanoes or things like that, that the oceans release CO2. So CO2 and temperature always go together. Either one can lead. Seems counterintuitive, but sometimes one goes up first, but they always go together in simple physics. As the planet gets warmer, the ice sheets change size. Simple physics. So this doesn't require an opinion or people can't challenge, well, what did the government fund for a study or what scientists want a grant or any of the nonsense that we're hearing. We need to forget politics for a moment. This is physics. And it's the planet we live on. And it's different than storms, but it will make storms worse. So what are the projections? If we take the last part of that last graph and project it forward to the degree that it's now, the momentum is there, that it's unstoppable, we come up with a range of projections. And partly it does depend on what we do with greenhouse gases and warming. But again, to some degree, the heat's already trapped in the system. There's no place to vent the heat that's in the ocean. You can't cool the ocean, not only by a sheer scale. We don't cool anything. All we do is a refrigerator and air conditioning just move heat from one from the inside the refrigerator to the kitchen or from your house outside. And it takes energy to move the heat. Right? Electricity. But you have to put the heat somewhere. And you can't put that extra heat that we've stored in the ocean anywhere. You can't vent into outer space. That's a vacuum. So again, it, I know it may seem obvious, but it's worth thinking about. There, there really is no, once the system's been warmed and you've trapped heat in it, the heat's there. Now, the Earth can do some things to bury that carbon and do some other things, but we're talking over geologic time, which is not even thousands, it's millions of years. So we, we have a house that's warmer. We put insulation in our attic, is what we've been doing. We didn't open the windows and we let the furnace continue with greater insulation in the roof, if you want to think of it that way. That's what we've been doing. And the temperature in the house is a degree and a half warmer. And the big blocks of ice are melting. And not only that, as the oceans change, change temperature, the currents of the ocean, not only the Gulf Stream, but all the currents, and the currents of the atmosphere change, because just like winter to summer, we know that patterns change. If you change the temperature input to the planet, as happens because of the orbit around the sun during winter and summer, currents change. We get different cycles of jet streams and ocean currents on a predictable basis. Well, the problem is we really don't have any way of knowing. We can model it, but models are just models. And we need to study it more. We need to model it better. But the models for how the currents will change to nuances of where storms will develop is frankly at the bleeding edge of our knowledge. Fortunately, great institutions like uh, GSO, URI here, and other oceanographic institutions around the world and climate institutions are doing fabulous work and need to do that. But let's not fool ourselves that we can predict weather or ocean currents or atmospheric currents 10 years from now, or even next year, because we're warming the system. The amount of heat we put in the system is equivalent to four Hiroshima-sized nuclear bombs every second. That's the amount of heat we're adding to the oceans as an external heat source. 
by the heat trapping. It's huge. Now the IPCC has a projection. The last IPCC report came out. How many of you have heard of the IPCC? Most of you. Uh, you know, it's been five or six years, and the last, the fifth report came out over the last year or so, and it says we could get between 10 to 32 inches of sea level rise. And most people think it means we could get between 10 to 32 inches of sea level rise for some reason. That's not what it means. If you read the fine print and you understand the protocols and methodologies of the IPCC, they are not saying 32 inches is the worst that can happen. In fact, if you read the text, it says something very, very different. It says, based upon thermal expansion of seawater, melting of glaciers, and what we know about Greenland, that's what we know can happen or will happen. And then there are some uncertainties. Methane and the collapse of the ice sheets. We can't model them. So we'll put them in there as a zero. The IPCC is not being asked to tell us what could happen. They're asking this, they're saying, what is scientific consensus? And more than 100 companies and countries and a thousand scientists say, what will happen that you'll stake your reputation on that you can quantify based upon peer reviewed literature uh, that's been published by a cutoff date this century? That adds up to 10 to 32 inches. The uncertainties have fallen off the table. I'm not trying to scare you folks, but one of the things that New Englanders are famous for um, is being realists and pragmatists. And what you do here with your coastal planning and resiliency is a great example. And I don't want to scare you in the sense that this isn't going to happen tomorrow. A storm could happen next week. We could get a 25-foot wave here, as Grover reminded me, in, in next week, right? A new weather system could spring up and you could have a 25-foot wave hit the south coast here next week that you can't even predict yet. This can't happen next week. This can't happen this decade. This can't happen this, the next decade. But this will happen in the next two or three centuries. So we need to think differently. Now, when I say that the IPCC doesn't do a very good job of predicting sea level, I'm not trying to be dis dismissive or derogatory. In fact, they do an incredible job, and most people who work on our are, are volunteers, and I have the greatest admiration for them. But let me also prove to you that they lowball the numbers unintentionally. This was their projection for sea level from 1990 in blue, different shades indicating different confidence factors. There's three different colored lines there, if you can see it. I've cut it off in the current year, 2014. In 2002, 12 years later, just a decade ago, they did another set of projections in green. A little higher, a little tighter, just as you predict. And as all the projections seem to do, they keep getting a little higher and a little tighter as you go forward in time, better models. Now we can look back and say, how well did they do? This is the published data by the IBCC. Well, in gold is the sea level rise. And in red is a smoothed out trend line. What it proves is that the models are low. And they're low for the reasons I gave you, that there are certain uncertainties that if you can't quantify, and you don't want to do the riskier or scary thing of saying, well, it could be this, you actually unintentionally show it lower. And hardly anybody's bridged from what scientists do to what engineers need or planners or businesses who really are more concerned about what could happen. Now the problem, as I say, is one area of Antarctica. This is back to that, what I showed earlier is the 8 o'clock position of the big Antarctic ice sheet. This is looking at it obliquely. And again, if you go to the my website, johnenglander.net, I think the last post, I, I point to two YouTube videos, and one of them will actually take you on a video tour that this photo comes from. Those six glaciers, just those six glaciers, which are on land, but actually go underwater as well, when they slide into the ocean, won't happen this decade, won't happen next decade for sure, uh, and you'll see why in the video. When those six glaciers slide into the sea, over a period of a decade or two, sometime this century, next century, the century thereafter, we will get 10 feet of sea level rise just from those six glaciers. 
I mean, this is in the pipeline, folks, and it's a new reality. It's not, you know, you go back here three or 400 years in this community, and it's a wonderful history, but that's a long history for America. But even in China, where I was two weeks ago, and they look back thousands of years, it's easy to overlook, you know, this reality as the planet's about to change. We need to keep doing the science and do the projections better and better. But methane's coming out of the ground, the permafrost, the seabed, there's a huge amount of methane. It's far more potent as a warming agent than CO2. And we can't model it. We just don't know how it's going to escape. It could happen over 500 years, it could happen over 5,000 years, it could happen over 100. We really don't know. Because we're warming so much faster than ever before. There is no way to go back in the geologic record and know what happens when you warm this fast, because it hasn't happened in 500 million years, this rate of warming. That's why the models are inadequate. And just to show you in a graphic form, I've taken IPCC data. This isn't the graph from them, from the IPCC, but it is actually from their table 13-5 uh, of the latest report. This is how they get the figures for sea level rise. Not many people have discern this, but uh, page, I think it's 1080 as I recall. Um, I've colored, I put in a stack bar graph to make it easier to understand. The red is thermal expansion of seawater. It's pretty easy to model that with the four different scenarios that they look at for what could happen this century. And on top of that are the glaciers in the yellow, or green, whatever that is. Purple is Greenland and Antarctica is in light blue at the top. Now these are four different warming scenarios from left to right in increasing intensity. It may take you a moment, but you're going to realize there's something bizarre. That as the planet gets warmer, why would Antarctica, the top blue, the very top of each of those, those stacks, not increase and decrease in the fourth scenario, the warmest one? And without getting into the esoteric geophysics, here's the problem. We don't know how those ice sheets that I just showed you, the pine island glaciers, are going to collapse. That's what will add to sea level rise. So that's left out of this because we can't quantify what will happen in the century. Okay? The reason that it goes, so, so there's a constant of what's predictable for sure. The reason it goes down in the worst warming scenarios is there's another phenomenon. Thank you. Um, that as the oceans warm and evaporate more, and put more moisture in the air. In certain parts of Antarctica, East Antarctica, there's more snow and technically less sea level. So that's what's being reflected here. But it shows you how it, it defies logic that if the planet goes to the extreme scenario of warming, that sea level will only rise that much because what's missing is the uncertainty of ice sheet collapse. If I was to put those same lines and just collapse them in height so that I could add in what comes from that pine island glaciers, you see proportionally the problem. We're all looking at the fractions of an inch from things we can quantify. And there's a factor which is three to five times bigger that we just can't quantify. So my takeaways are that storms plus extreme times plus sea level rise is vulnerability now. After years of stability, sea level's rising. We can slow it, but we can't stop it. We need to recognize that. The trend can be your friend even if you don't like where it's going. I mean, I'm getting older. I don't like that. Okay. People say, what are we going to do at sea level? Well, I said, we're going to have to deal with it. You know, I don't like getting older. But we all know that if we take care of ourselves, whether it's exercise or diet, or and just recognize that we're getting older, we can adapt to it. And it's kind of the same. The planet's changing. It has changed before. It's changed in the natural cycles. But it's a new reality to us. You here in Rhode Island have a very unique situation. You're the smallest state, you have a bad economy, you have lots of challenges, and you're dominated by a big body of water. All those things could be seen as the glass half empty. I suggested last night to the audience that uh, you could also look at it as a glass half full. You're a very cohesive state. You have incredible cooperation between the state, the universities, and the private sector. Witness our being here today better than any place I've seen. You're knowledgeable. You're I mean, astute. I, I'm not, I haven't given one science fact that Dean Corliss didn't know before my book was published. I'm not telling you news. 
but I am helping to translate science to you in a different way than you've ever heard it before. Just as CRC is and EEM and CRMC, if I got the initials right. Um, and on top of that, you actually, while you could look at Narragansett Bay as the biggest vulnerability, it's the biggest opportunity, because not many states, like Florida, Florida is the other extreme. It's out in the Atlantic and porous limestone and no way to protect it. Within the next couple of centuries, you'll protect the Narragansett Bay. There will be barriers coming off of Jamestown, I guess it is, right, on either side, with locks allowing boats to go in and out. Now, I don't think it'll happen this century, but I guarantee you in the next 300 years, it's going to happen. It's inevitable. If you can protect that much real estate with a couple of barriers, smaller than the Three Gorges Dam, which we built in China, um, you're going to do it. Economic imperative. Different places have different vulnerability. That's San Francisco Bay. There are cities in the Bay of San Francisco that are built on fill land two feet above sea level that are going to flood instantly when sea level gets that high. Sacramento is 80 miles from the ocean on a tidal river, protected by bad earthen levees. Highly vulnerable. So I want you to realize that your vulnerability is not unique. In fact, you could turn your weakness into a strength. You can prepare for this. You have the attitude, the grit, the awareness, and the coastal um, attitude, if you will, here in the ocean state that really could be the blessing in disguise. We can't leave the coast. We need ports, we need fishing, we need recreation. Um, we're always going to have coasts. Moving to Denver is not the solution. The Dutch have pioneered some techniques. This is a photo of, uh, of Blessingen. Uh, they've got some techniques now of, of ideas to build roadways even in, in berms. I need to finish this up here. Uh, some innovative designs. And uh, we can learn from them, but our situation here is different. What I hope we don't do is make the mistake of these gates in Rotterdam that we've all seen. The Maslon Karen. Did I get that right, Anton? Yeah. The, uh, the big gates of Rotterdam Harbor. When they designed this 20, 30 years ago, they planned for a foot of sea level and 10,000 years of storm history. <laughs> they now know that the foot of sea level is inadequate. The billion dollars spent on those gates had the wrong design criteria. If you know where things are headed in the future, you can plan and design for it and build to it. And I hope that today as we continue and hear really practical good examples from people much more expert than I, that we keep that in mind. There's storm surge and defenses and there's adaptations. But let's design knowing where things are headed for the long term because it's our legacy and for not only our kids and grandkids, but really for the future of this country, but this state and the world. You all have a great opportunity to set an example. If you'd like copies of my slides uh, to finish, just send an email. You don't even need the content. Just put your name in the body. It's ri for Rhode Island at johnenglander.net. And I will send you copies of the graphics, uh, a couple of the pages of information that may be of use to you. So ri at johnenglander.net. Thank you very much. We're going to spend much of the rest of the day talking uh, more specifically about the Rhode Island context and actions that we are taking here in Rhode Island and actions that we might take and could take. Uh, but we do have time for a couple of questions uh, following that terrific presentation from John Englander. Uh, if you would like to speak, please raise your hand. We'll give you a microphone because we're recording the conversation. We have uh, a couple of questions for John Englander. Uh, do you want a microphone? This is yeah. the way I'm recording. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Chuck Michaelis with the uh, Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. But uh, to the point of your IPCC reports where they uh, do not include those uncertainties and those uh, variables that include the methane and the uh, glacier, the glacier melting. Um, it's obviously it's, it's concerning because they don't put that out there up front for engineers and planners. Um, and I understand that scientists may not want to put their name on it on a document like that because they're a little bit off. But I'm surprised because even slosh models have a correction factor in there of 20%. And so 
you know, when you have those numbers on there, at least say, um, and, then, and the methane itself and the glacier melting itself may outweigh what they put the numbers on now, but to include some kind of caveat up front saying, you know, plus or minus 20%, 50%, 100%, whatever it is. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and I agree with you. In, in logical terms, from a risk standpoint, a business standpoint, you'd want to know what could happen. Right? The problem, though, is that there's been enough political attack and defensiveness on the part of the scientific community to be able to defend every number they say, that that's how they get their methodology, and nobody wants to go beyond the IPCC and say that they're, you know, that, that it could be worse than that for obvious reasons, too. But there are other reports. The Stern report that was done in, in England about but eight years ago, I think, looked at risk much better. Uh, the National Climate Assessment talks about one to six feet of sea level rise now. Okay, now the idea is that we can have one foot or eight inches, which are in some of the low, is ridiculous. I mean, that would require no warming, and that would be that the next century is the same as the last century, which is only true in North Carolina. Um, we're in part of century. Uh, that, uh, that's true. <laughs> They, they, they go back out of that reality because the outer banks are more exposed than you are. Uh, but anyway, that's the problem, is that, that nobody wants to say, well, let's go worse than the IPCC, even though from, from a risk standpoint. But it's so slow that really the greater proximate problem, the greater immediate problem, is the storm surge, which you're more planning for. And, and again, when you're talking about sea level in the next three decades, it's going to be three inches to be a lot. That nowhere even balancing the 25 foot you get storm wave. So that's the problem. We have one more question. So, uh, uh, sorry, can wait for the... Thanks, Bruce. Bruce uh, Dean Corliss, would, would you say, was that a fair statement? I mean, you're, the, you're much more credible as a scientific expert than I am. But, okay, this is absolute thing. So you're right, we're doing a great job here in Rhode Island to uh, understand these risks and get a plan for them similarly for the entire Northern region. However, all the great plans are going to require a lot of federal funding. How do we move from uh, local successes, activist states, if you will, to changing the discussion at the federal level? You know, I, I certainly am totally unqualified to answer that question. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I also don't know that it has to come from the federal government. And, and I mean that sincerely. When we look at the long term, how communities are going to adapt, okay? Um, Rhode Island could easily model itself as the ocean state rising to the challenge, rising for the future, and, and turn you know, risk into an asset and plan for the future and have ports that are adaptable and better able to accommodate 10 feet of sea level rise. Um, there may be ways to self-finance that, to, to private sector, to, to you know, P3s, the private public partnerships. Who knows? I'm not saying what the answer is. I'm not saying you shouldn't go for federal money, okay? All I'm saying is, there's not enough money for the federal government to adapt the United States to sea level rise. Just doesn't exist. Um, well, I guess we can keep printing money. We're not used to doing it. Just use that kind of funny money. But um, the fact is, there is not enough wealth to replace the assets in all our coastal regions. We don't know what the policy solution to that is. An important discussion to have, but that's way beyond today. It's going to take us a while to adapt. It's going to take us probably a generation. It's certainly going to take us decades. You know, when Janet uh, just sneezed, we all said, God bless you. We've been doing that for 1,500 years because Pope Gregory I said we should do that because the sneeze was the sign of the plague and people were dying from the plague in 590. We're still tripping over ourselves to say, God bless you, because tight. It takes a while to change cultures. <laughs> We are, unfortunately are going to have to move on to our next our next session. Uh, John Englander will be with us for a little while today, so I hope uh, he'll be around all day. So if you have questions for him, you all have the book that he wrote, so you'll have a chance to read that uh, after the conference. But please uh, talk to him if you have questions, and we're going to move on. And just please help me thank him for his presentation.